of the webinar. First note that the chat function has been disabled as has the raise hand function. So to ask questions, you can use the Q&A function. So you should see a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You will be able to see one another's questions. And if there's a question that you like, or you have the same question, you can upvote it. So it'll be a little sort of thumbs up sign by it. You can click that. And then the more upvotes one has, it'll move up on our question list. If you wish to remain anonymous when asking questions, there's an option to do that when you put your question in. Um, for this webinar, um, after I finish my introduction, we will have uh, Richard Maley present, and then we'll turn to questions afterwards, and hopefully we'll have a time to get through um, all or at least most of your questions. Um, also note that at the end of the webinar, there will be a link that pops up to our feedback form. So if you can, we'd really appreciate it if you fill that out. And lastly, please note that the webinar is being recorded um, and it will be available on our YouTube channel, on our website um, within a couple days. So um, this webinar is part of the online charter series and this series is intended to provide information about specific charter sections. In today's webinar, uh, Richard Maley, PhD and a research associate with the center will discuss, that, discuss section 33 of the charter or the notwithstanding clause. Um, this clause has been in the news over the past year, uh, particularly with Quebec's Bill 21 and also um, when it came to Ontario with some third party election advertising law. Um, so before I turn things over to you, to Richard Maley, um, I'd like to provide a brief introduction. Uh, we're pleased to have him joining us from Belfast to, to today. Um, he uh, completed his bachelor's and master's degrees in law at the University of Glasgow, and then completed his PhD in constitutional theory and comparative constitutional law at the University of Luxembourg, where he also taught courses in constitutional law, contract law, and legal theory. Uh, he then taught in the International Legal Studies Program at the University of Trier in Germany, before moving to Edmonton, where he completed a one-year postdoctoral at the University of Alberta. Um, since completing his PhD, he has focused on processes of constitutional change and on the questions of legitimacy that surround those changes. Um, and he's had his work published in several law journals, including the International Constitutional Law, Seattle University Law Review, Liverpool Law Review, um, as well as one of the center's uh, journals, the Constitutional Forum, and many others. Um, and he has been working uh, with the center since August 2020 and has worked on numerous projects with us and is still continuing to work on, on many projects uh, more as well. So with that, I will turn things over to, to Richard. Hello, folks. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, thanks very much to Alina for the intro and um, thanks to all of you for signing up and tuning in. I'm just gonna start screen sharing share my PowerPoint with you. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that. Um, so, uh, hello again. Um, no, I, I don't want to keep you for too long here. Uh, I'll speak for maybe like 25 to 30 minutes uh, and then we can do some questions at the end. Uh, so just before we dive in, I should be a bit more specific, I guess, about what I'm going to talk about today. Um, and basically what I'm going to try to give you is a short philosophical theoretical analysis of the notwithstanding clause. So we're not going to cover too much constitutional law. Uh, we're not going to cover too much constitutional history. Uh, we're going to talk instead about different ways of theoretically justifying the notwithstanding clause. And for each of the justifications that we'll propose and examine, I'll offer some brief counterpoints. So we'll go point, counterpoint, point, counterpoint until we run out of points and counterpoints. Uh, or run out of time or until I run out of energy. Uh, so with that said, I want to take a few minutes uh, initially just to give you a quick primer on the notwithstanding clause and to answer some of the questions that you might have if your only encounter with the clause has been through maybe occasional references in the news. I know there's been a bit more chat about the clause recently, as Alina said. Uh, so let's start with uh, the where, the why, and the what. Uh, so where do you find the notwithstanding clause? Why does it exist? And what does it say? Well, first off, um, 
we'll start with the absolute basics. The notwithstanding clause is part of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Uh, the charter was passed in 1982, uh, and it's itself part of a bigger piece of legislation called the Constitution Act 1982. Uh, and the Constitution Act was a, a big deal, if you don't know. It was the, the end result of years, actually decades, of attempts to patriate Canada's constitution, to bring the constitution, and in particular the power to change or amend the constitution into Canada for the first time, uh, to bring it home or to patriate it. Because up until that point, the UK Parliament in London had retained the formal power to amend the constitution of Canada. So patriation was very simply about bringing the constitution home, about having Canada finally take full uh, decisive control of its own constitutional law. Now, this initiative, patriation, uh, didn't necessarily have much to do with fundamental rights, but it got coupled by circumstance with the long-term goal of then Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau, you can see on the slide, uh, to pass a Canadian Charter of Rights. Uh, a charter that would look a lot like the bills of rights that already existed in countries like the US or Germany. And this charter wasn't just meant to be a list of important rights. It wasn't just symbolic. Um, it was meant to be legally effective and legally enforceable as well. And so the big thing that the charter was meant to do was to give courts the power to enforce certain individual rights against the state. And that meant giving courts the power to strike down or nullify legislation that infringes rights that are listed in the Charter. Now that specific kind of judicial review was a new thing in Canada. And it was a contentious idea because giving courts the power to nullify legislation that uh, conflicts with rights means giving an unelected, unaccountable branch of government, the judiciary, the power to overrule an elected publicly accountable branch, the legislature. And this meant taking a slice of power away from elected officials uh, in, in the provinces as well as federally, which a number of provincial governments, uh, especially Western ones, including Alberta, really didn't want. So a number of provinces didn't want to give up this particular slice uh, of their power. And because Trudeau ultimately needed the approval of most provinces for patriation to succeed, these provinces had a lot of negotiating clout uh, and power and they were ultimately able to pressure Trudeau into adding a provision to the Charter, the notwithstanding clause, uh, that would let legislatures shield legislation from invalidation by the courts, at least under certain circumstances. Now to understand uh, what these circumstances are, uh, we'll need to look at what the notwithstanding clause says. Uh, so it appears under section 33 of the Charter and it states that, uh, I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit here, it states that parliament or the legislature of a province may expressly declare that an act or a provision of an act shall operate notwithstanding a provision included in section two or section seven to 15 of the charter. Uh, so what does this first part of section 33 tell us? Well, it already tells us which institutions have the power to use the notwithstanding clause. That would be the federal parliament and the provincial legislatures. It also tells us that the, the notwithstanding clause only insulates laws from certain kinds of charter challenges, uh, namely challenges that are brought under section two of the charter or under any of the sections from seven through to 15. And these sections do contain a lot of really important charter rights. Uh, section two, for example, contains the rights to freedom of religion, expression, assembly, and association. Section 7 to 14 contain a lot of important criminal process rights, and section 15 protects individuals from certain kinds of discrimination. So these are big sections. Uh, they protect some really fundamental personal and social interests, and yet the notwithstanding clause permits legislatures uh, to knowingly pass laws that violate these interests or these rights without the risk of their laws being struck down by the courts. So that's what the first part of section 33 tells us. But the clause actually continues. And what it tells us in the subsequent subsections uh, is that the use of the notwithstanding clause has a time limit on it, a time limit of five years. When five years pass since the notwithstanding clause was first invoked, 
the invocation will cease to have legal effect uh, and it'll then be up to the legislature to renew it again if it wants to. Now, there's no legal limit on how many times uh, the clause can be renewed, but there is a sort of political limit. And the political limit is that within each five year period, the parliament or the legislature will have been restaffed. There will have been at least one election in that intervening period. So there's a good chance that when the notwithstanding clause is up for renewal, it'll be a quite different group of people that are making the decision. This is the sort of insurance policy that's built into the clause uh, that if a particular government invokes it for partisan, purely ideological reasons, it's quite likely that a parliament or legislature with a different political tilt or slant will let it lapse or will repeal it. Uh, the important point being invoking the clause is temporary. It's really not very likely that it'll be enforced for more than five years, although it is technically possible. Now, I think this is a good place to sum up what we've covered so far. Uh, so to reiterate then, the notwithstanding clause was sort of, I don't like the term, but sort of crowbarred in to the charter at the behest of a number of provinces, which wanted to protect their own legislative power. And the result is a clause that lets provincial and federal laws remain in force, uh, remain valid, despite the fact that they either potentially violate the charter or have been held to violate the charter by the courts. So this sounds like a really significant power, a power to basically derogate from constitutional rights, but it's subject to at least two important limitations. Firstly, uh, that the clause only lets legislatures override certain specific charter rights, uh, the rights in section two and in section seven to 15 of the charter, and secondly, the specific use of the clause will lapse after five years and will then have to be renewed by a newly configured legislature, one that's been restaffed via election. Uh, and another political limit, by the way, on the clause is that, uh, and we will touch on this a bit later, but that most governments don't want to look or appear like they're violating rights, uh, which means that most governments have a strong political incentive from the start to not use the clause at all. So we'll touch on that again a bit later. Now, um, I think that's, uh, that's as much of an intro as we need to what the clause is and what it does. Uh, and so I want to shuttle quite quickly then to the question uh, that we're really here to talk about, the question of justification. And I'll pose the question, uh, why is the clause justifiable? Uh, I'll pose it in a slightly more complicated way. Why should we give legislatures the ability to ignore or avoid judicial decisions regarding charter rights, to ignore or avoid their otherwise binding obligation to respect charter rights. Well, let's look at a few of the possible justifications for the clause. And the first justification that I wanna look at, uh, which is probably the one that most Canadian lawyers are most familiar with, is that the notwithstanding clause promotes dialogue between courts and legislatures. Now, what does this mean uh, and why would this, i.e. dialogue, be desirable? Well, let's think about what the Charter is. The Charter is a, a document, a legal document, that contains lots of highly abstract, really vague moral language. It talks about things like liberty, security of the person, um, equality, equal protection, things that mean very different things to different people. And because the language of the Charter is so open-ended, so open-textured, there's no reason to think that courts are necessarily better at interpreting the Charter than legislatures. And in fact, there's every reason to think that democratically elected lawmakers, because they're elected and because they're accountable to the general public, should have a role to play in interpreting the Charter and should be able to respond meaningfully when they think uh, a judicial interpretation isn't quite right. That's dialogue. A, a court strikes down a piece of legislation and the legislature then gets to come back and say, no, uh, we don't think that was right. We think a better interpretation of the charter would have upheld our law and we're therefore going to reenact it. So you have a judicial ruling on the one hand and you have a legislative reply on the other. You have a kind of dialogue, a conversation between these two, two uh, differently positioned branches of government. Uh, 
The thing is, uh, this isn't the only way that you can think about the notwithstanding process, about the process of invoking it. And to offer an alternative perspective, uh, a counterpoint, I want to use a brief example. So I want you to imagine that I invite you to my house and I ask you to take off your shoes when you get there. So imagine that I make that request uh, and you say no. You don't say, do you mind if I just wipe my shoes on the doormat? Uh, you don't say, do you mind if I put on a clean pair of shoes that I brought with me? You just say, no, uh, I'm going to come in with my shoes on, like it or lump it. Well, that's kind of how the notwithstanding clause works. A court issues a ruling, something more important, obviously, than don't wear your shoes in the house. And the legislature chooses to completely disregard it. Now, when you think about it in these sort of everyday terms, that's not really dialogue, is it? Uh, there's no exchange of perspectives. There's no effort to compromise. There's just this flat rejection. Um, and the thing that makes flat rejection via the notwithstanding clause so problematic is that it's rarely, rarely, rarely necessary. Because the way that judicial decisions about the charter work is they give legislatures a roadmap of how to amend laws to make them charter compliant. Uh, the legal tests that courts use in charter cases make it possible in most situations to pinpoint where a given law slipped from compliance with the charter into non-compliance. So it'll usually be possible for a legislature to go back to the drawing board, make some probably very minor revisions to the invalidated law, and to enact a new modified version of the law a version that takes the court's reasoning into account. Now that, I'd suggest, is dialogue, uh, because it involves the legislature replying in a way that shows that they've listened, uh, in a way that shows a basic layer of respect for the court's perspective, while still maintaining the legislature's commitment to the goals that the invalidated law was meant to serve, because they are still remaking the same law, they're just modifying it. So that's a counterpoint to the dialogue argument. Uh, the counterpoint being that using the notwithstanding clause to simply reenact an invalidated law as it was is actually a lot less dialogic uh, than the alternative process of making small changes, small tweaks to the law to try and make it charter compliant. Now, that's just the first of three justifications that I wanna briefly look at here. And the second justification is different in terms of the way that it views democracy. Uh, so the justification that we just dealt with seems to assume that democracy is all about deliberation. It's about an exchange of ideas, not just between individuals, but between institutions, between courts and legislatures. By contrast, uh, this second justification that I want to look at assumes that democracy is less about deliberation, less about dialogue, and more about popular sovereignty, about letting the people in a jurisdiction have their say and have their voice. And what that means at its simplest uh, is that the people, the general public, should, as far as possible, be the ultimate judge of what government should and shouldn't do. That's popular sovereignty. So if the people of a province feel very strongly that an invalidated law should be reenacted by a section 33, then on this view, uh, the law should be reenacted. That's democracy. What the people want, the people get. And the appropriate institution to give the people what they want is their legislature, the institution that they have staffed with people they have elected. Now, uh, this sounds maybe pretty great, and pretty democratic. Uh, but if you dig a little deeper, you might realize that there are some difficulties, at least two difficulties, with accepting this idea. And the first difficulty is that this framing of popular sovereignty is quite quick to conflate the people uh, with their elected representatives. And one of the reasons that this is potentially problematic is that although legislatures are elected, uh, we know that their behavior in relation to certain issues uh, might not reflect what most members of the public want. Uh, it might instead reflect, say, an attempt on the part of government to appeal to hardline supporters or maintain relative harmony among uh, its party's MPs or MLAs or whatever. Uh, so think about the pandemic response uh, in Alberta. 
you've sometimes seen quite high public support for various restrictions uh, that the government has been hesitant to introduce uh, because of dissent within the UCP and within the UCP's base. And without wanting to, to make any specific or further comments on that, you can use that as a good example of the way that a legislature can sometimes drift a bit from the majority will. So that's point one. Uh, we should be careful about too fully uh, or too automatically conflating elected representatives and the people they represent. Uh, these are two distinct groups with distinct goals that can drift apart. This then brings us very neatly to point two, uh, which is that we should also be careful about being too quick to conflate a majority of the voting public with the people of a province or, or a nation, with the people of Alberta or Canada or whatever. Um, now, this might sound a little strange because we're accustomed, I think, uh, to thinking about the will of the people as the will of a majority of the people. Uh, but of course, a majority of voters is just a very large subsection of the people. And so even if a majority in a given province do actually want a nullified law reinstated, and do want to effectively override a particular charter right via section 33, there's an extra logical leap required there to say that this is the will of the people. Now at this point you might think, uh, nonsense. A majority vote is just, it's just how we have to resolve public disagreements uh, and make decisions. You're never gonna please everyone. So the only fair way forward is if governments do what most people want. Well, the thing is, uh, Canada is not just uh, a majoritarian democracy, it's a constitutional democracy with a charter of rights. And the whole point of a constitution with a charter of rights, I think, uh, is to try and make sure that the laws and policies that a majority of the public want, or that their government wants, are compatible with the very basic uh, fundamental interests of people who aren't part of the majority, i.e. minorities and uh, individuals. So constitutional democracy is really about trying to represent the people as a whole. It's about letting the majority do what it wants, provided that it respects the most basic interests, the constitutional rights of people who aren't part of the majority. You're representing the majority by giving them choice most of the time, and you're representing the minority by placing a few limits uh, on the courses of action that the majority can choose. It's about balance and compromise uh, in the name of the whole, in the name of all people and not just a majority. Uh, it's like if you have a bunch of kids, let's say you've got five kids and you let them choose a game to play, you'll probably figure that the best and the fairest way to let them choose their game uh, is by having a quick vote. But if the result of the vote is that four of them choose the game of beating up the fifth, you probably feel it's fair to ask the four uh, to choose a different game. Uh, and you probably feel like that choice of game doesn't represent, and by definition can't represent the group. That can't be the group's choice. That can't be a choice that you attribute to the group as a whole. And that's what courts are meant to do using the charter, I think. Uh, they're meant to tell governments uh, which aren't taking everyone's or a particular group's or a particular individual's basic interests into account to modify what they're doing. And that's much more representative of the people as a whole than if you just let majority sentiments drive government policy. Now, uh, I have talked for a while already, and I don't want to drone on for too much longer, um, but I do have one more justification that I want to touch on. And it's one that I think is quite compelling. Uh, and the gist of the justification is that the notwithstanding clause allows legislatures to correct judicial mistakes. So the basic premise of the justification is that judges make mistakes. Now, historically, yes, Correct, this is true. Um, if you look at the US, which has had much more experience with judicial enforcement of rights than Canada, there have been long stretches of time, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, when the US Supreme Court has imposed highly questionable, uh, problematic ideas on the whole country through constitutional interpretation. I mean, in the early 1900s, for example, the, the Supreme Court struck down all kinds of protections for American workers because they 
were inconsistent with the court's sort of free market ideology, which is to say that the court for decades uh, made American workers' lives less secure, more difficult, less protected. So judges make mistakes. Uh, history teaches us that specific courts can move off in really problematic and indeed socially harmful directions. The important and sticky question though, uh, is what counts as a judicial mistake? Uh, well, we can't set the bar too low. It can't just be about decisions that we disagree with because uh, then those are gonna pop up all the time. It's gotta be about something more. Uh, it's gotta be about decisions that really are unreasonable are grossly unreasonable maybe in some basic sense. And I think for most of the time that section 33, the notwithstanding clause has been in force. This is the way that most governments have viewed it. They viewed it as a sort of nuclear option, a way for legislatures to jump in and intervene when the judiciary just goes that little bit too far. So there's been a kind of culture of restraint, political re restraint surrounding the clause, which is good. Uh, it's a culture that encourages legislatures to let courts do their thing for the most part. Uh, and to respect their rulings, unless they just go uh, beyond the pale, unless their decisions veer into the territory of sort of being grossly unreasonable. Now, I've got two uh, quite different thoughts in response to that argument. And the first one is uh, that the best way to identify and respond to a potential judicial mistake isn't necessarily to invite a, a knee-jerk reply from a particular single legislature. Uh, and the obvious but difficult alternative to this uh, invites a maybe more careful national conversation on the merits of a questionable judgment is to amend the constitution, uh, to change the constitution in a way that shuts down the questionable or unreasonable judicial interpretation. Now, if you followed Canadian politics for the last 40 years, uh, you'll know that this is very, very hard. Uh, for most changes to the Charter, you need Parliament and seven provincial legislatures that represent 50% of the population of all the provinces uh, to ratify the amendment. And that's only happened once back in 1983. But the big reason that this type of amendment hasn't happened recently, uh, I'd suggest, is that Canada's leaders stopped trying to change the constitution. They stopped about 30 years ago because they thought it was politically inexpedient and too tough. And that's not necessarily a good thing. Uh, it's not a good thing to be obsessed with constitutional change, to try and change your constitution all the time. Uh, but it's maybe equally bad to completely stop having national interprovincial conversations about how a constitution might be improved from time to time. And I think one of those times when you might want to have one of those national conversations is when a lot of people think the Supreme Court has made a big mistake or a series of big mistakes. So that's my first thought in response to this, uh, this particular justification. My second uh, quite different thought is about the culture of restraint uh, that I just mentioned uh, that so far surrounded section 33. And the clearest evidence that this culture exists is that the federal parliament has never used the notwithstanding clause and a majority of provinces have never used the notwithstanding clause. In fact, the only province that has officially used it more than once is Quebec, uh, which has its own unique story when it comes to the Charter of Rights. So there has been a culture of restraint, uh, a culture of generally not using Section 33 and showing a certain deference to judicial decisions regarding charter rights. But there's a possibility that this culture is now being eroded. And the thing uh, that's maybe eroding it is populism, uh, which at its core is about thinking that a particular leader or government is uniquely positioned, uniquely qualified to speak for the people and solve societal problems. And because populists think their preferred leader or government is so uniquely qualified to govern, they also think that anything that places limits uh, on what their government can do is bad by definition. So judicial decisions that strike down a populist government's laws 
don't deserve respect or deference because for populists, uh, they subvert the will of the people, assuming that the will is being authentically represented by the populist government in the populists' eyes. Now, um, maybe this is obvious, but if this attitude, the populist attitude, continues to become more prevalent in Canada, the notwithstanding clause could become something quite different from what it has been, something that's much harder, I think, to justify. Because if we have more populist governments, the chances increase of the clause being used uh, not to target and correct judicial mistakes, but to basically avoid judicial oversight altogether. And I think that's probably the big danger that Section 33 poses in the coming years, um, not making any predictions about what will happen uh, or about how the political culture will continue to evolve in what direction. But there's definitely a risk that if, if the culture evolves in a populist direction, the use of the notwithstanding clause could end up being normalized, which is to say that it could lose its identity, the clause could lose its identity as a nuclear option, as a way of responding to exceptional serious judicial mistakes. And it could become more like an everyday tool uh, that governments can use to get things done and to bypass the charter at their convenience whenever the charter becomes inconvenient. So um, it's kind of a bleak note to end on. I, I apologize for that, but I, uh, I think I really do have to end there and take some questions. And um, I apologize in advance that because I'm a legal theorist and constitutional theorist rather than the Canadian constitutional lawyer, I might struggle with more uh, technical doctrinal questions if you have them, but I'll do my very best. And while I'm doing that, just before Alina comes back in, uh, I do also want to share a poll with you um, on the justifiability of Section 33, because I'd love to know your thoughts as a group. So I'm launching the poll now. You should be able to see it on your screen soon. Uh, and I'll hand over there to Alina with your questions. Uh, thanks very much for listening. Thank you so much for that presentation, Richard. Um, that, I think that was a really um, great presentation walking us through uh, you know, how, how the clause came into place and then also um, what some of the problems and justifications are, are with it. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to turn to the questions. Um, as I noted at the beginning of the presentation, you can answer your questions by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And I will read out the questions um, for Richard and I can see the polls going there as well. So um, the first question here, and I think they mean section 33, they wrote section 43 is in Canada, and you talked about this a little bit, but I don't know if maybe you want to comment on it a little bit further, is in Canada has section 33 been used by any government since 1982? Yes. Uh, so. Depends on exactly what the question is. Uh, if you're talking about Canadian governments, if you're talking about the federal government, then no, the federal government has never used Section 33. Uh, and in fact, um, it, so it, it, if you're thinking about provincial governments as well, it, then it depends on what you count as a use of Section 33. By the way, is it very, very dark on my screen? Yes, you're, you're a little bit dark, okay. I think. Can I quickly turn on the light? And I'm back. Um, so it depends on what you count as a use of Section 33. Uh, if you focus only on those uses that actually became legally effective, there have only been, I think, five uses of the notwithstanding clause. So initially, Quebec used the clause just as a blanket override uh, because of issues that it had with the passage of uh, the Charter and the Constitution Act. Quebec felt that it had basically been cut out of the deal that Trudeau struck with the provinces on the passage of the Constitution Act. And so they protested by applying the notwithstanding clause to all of their laws. So to basically say that any Quebec law uh, that violates the charter will remain valid, notwithstanding that violation. Uh, that was in 1982, immediately after the passage of the charter and the notwithstanding clause. The next use, I believe, was the next use that became effective was in Saskatchewan, 1986. Uh, and then the, the one after that, which was very contentious at the time and played a role in constitutional politics at the time, was in 1988. So 
uh, there was a decision, a Supreme Court decision called Ford v. Quebec, which invalidated uh, what's sort of colloquial known as, colloquially known as the Quebec Signs Law, uh, which required that certain commercial signage was in French rather than other languages. And after that decision was handed down by the Supreme Court, uh, the Bourassa government in Quebec um, invoked the notwithstanding clause to reenact that law. Uh, that invocation lasted, I think, for five years. Um, and that was uh, an important moment, by the way, in uh, the attempt to pass the Meech Lake Accord at the time. So um, a, a lot of the Meech Lake Accord was a package of sort of Quebec-centric constitutional amendments. It was an attempt on the part of the federal government and the other provinces to meet Quebec's basic demands on uh, what they wanted from the constitution because they felt betrayed. In 1982, there was a sense that it was important to uh, do something to bring Quebec into the constitutional family in Canada. Um, whenever Bourassa invoked the notwithstanding clause, a lot of or a certain amount of support for that Meech Lake Accord uh, started to ebb away because there was a fear that the changes that Quebec wanted from the constitution would basically enable them to do the same thing more and more. Um, so that was 1988. You then have to wait, I believe, I hope I'm right about this, but I think you have to wait until 2019, until Quebec's Bill 21, for a use of the notwithstanding clause that actually becomes legally effective. And then we had a, a use again in Ontario this year. Uh, the Ford government used it. They, they had a law invalidated by the Ontario Superior Court. And basically what the law did was it's uh, put restrictions on third party uh, spending on political advertising uh, that would apply during the 12 month period in the run up to an election cycle. Uh, that was invalidated on free expression grounds. And rather than, for example, uh, narrowing the period to which the restrictions would apply, which I think the Superior Court suggested was one way around the charter challenge, the Ford government decided to use the notwithstanding clause, reenact it without change, um, and that's the situation today. So there have been, I believe, uh, I, maybe there's someone in the, the Q&A can correct me on this, but I believe five uses that have gone into legal effect. That's a long answer to a short question. Thank you so much, Richard. Um, so this is an interesting question. It says, what are your thoughts on the potential applicability of section one to the use of section 33? Could it be said that the very use of Section 33 should be subject to judicial review under Section 1? I think there is an interesting argument that this could be the case. There seems to be nothing in the text of either section that expressly excludes the applicability of Section 1 to the use of Section 33. I'm trying, so, so this seems like a really interesting question. I'm trying to wrap my head around it though. Um, So, so, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm try, trying to understand the question. Maybe we should put a pin in that one and go back to it. Sure. Because it, it seems interesting. Um, so there's another one here. Um, living in Ontario, we have seen our premier use or threaten to use Section 33. Is there any way to limit its use by one government? Uh, I'm going to give you an answer that you might not want. Repeal it. Um, I, I, to be a bit blunt, I don't think it should be in the constitution for some of the reasons that I mentioned. Um, like getting it out of the constitution is very, very hard. As, as I said, um, it, I, I think getting rid of section 33 would require the use of the 750 rule, seven provinces equaling 50% of the population. Again, if someone in the chat wants to correct me on that, they certainly can. Um, but no, there, there's, there's no, at, at present, based on the Supreme Court's interpretation in Ford v. Quebec, uh, there are no real meaningful limits. Uh, there are obviously limits built into the clause itself. So the fact that it has to be renewed every five years, well, in five years time, you might not have the same government in Ontario. Uh, the fact that it only applies to uh, certain charter rights, it doesn't apply, for example, to the right to vote. Um, in section three or the right to move freely within Canada in section six uh, or uh, minority language education rights in section 23. 
or Aboriginal treaty rights, which aren't part of the charter, but it also doesn't apply to those. So there are a certain amount of limits built into the clause. Uh, but I think the, the solution for the notwithstanding clause, if you don't like it, uh, is a movement to remove it from the constitution. And, and as I, I think one of the arguments that I touched on briefly in my presentation uh, is, you know, there's this sense in Canada where there has been for about 30 years that the am amendment formula uh, that Canada got with patriation is too difficult to use. Uh, Mulroney tried to use it in 1987 with the Mutual Accords, tried to use it again in 1992 with the Charlottetown Accord, and it didn't work, and it cost him his political reputation. Uh, so uh, the political penalty of trying to change the constitution is too high, and the amending formula is too difficult to use, uh, so we shouldn't try. Uh, there are specific features of the Meech Lake Accord and the Charlottetown Accord, though, that explain why those initiatives failed. So with Meech Lake, there were process issues. People perceived the process as uh, too secretive, insufficiently inclusive. I think that's one of the big reasons that it, that it failed. Uh, with the Charlottetown Accords, um, the problem is the Accord itself, that it was a massive package, a 60 item package of amendments um, that was very difficult to sell to the whole country. Uh, you know, it gave everyone something that they wanted and gave everyone a lot of what they didn't want. So um, what Canada hasn't tried for 30 years since Charlottetown is issue specific amendments. I think the amendment formula is usable if you use it in a targeted way. And if the right sort of culture of uh, mutual respect evolves around the use of the clause so that people are willing to say, okay, we're going to use it for this one particular thing. We're not going to try to use it for our own purposes, uh, the purposes that our province prioritizes or whatever. Um, so I, I think Canadians and lots of people should think more about constitutional amendment. If you don't like something, if, if you don't like a constitutional provision, uh, have faith that you can change it. That's the democratic way. Thank you, Richard. So I wonder if this is a good time to maybe take a peek at the poll. It actually looks fairly evenly divided between the sort of three top responses. Which is more than I could have hoped for. <laughs> that's, that's great. Here, I'll just share it so people can see, but you can see that it's fairly evenly divided. So I don't know if you want to offer any comments on that. It just seemed to connect well to what you were talking about. Well, I see that there's a narrow majority, uh, a two percent majority in favor of uh, the notwithstanding clause, but with modification. Uh, so, the, the the way that happens is through constitutional amendments. So, I assume at least a number of respondents in the poll have the same faith that constitutional amendment is possible. It may not have worked in the past, but it is possible. Wonderful. So it looks like there's another question here, or I guess a comment. Um, there is a fourth justification from the participants from the Alberta and Saskatchewan Lougheed and Blackney not covered by your summary. They argued that enacting a charter would weaken the role and convention of parliaments to protect minority rights. I think this has happened. Parliament and provinces stand by and let the courts do it. P.S. I was lead official here at BC and suppose you can say maybe second author or supporting author, um, an author with Paul Wheeler of Section 33, notwithstanding compromise in the negotiations of 1981. I, I think that's a great point. Um, I, I mean, it would be interesting to see, um, you know, a sort of comprehensive study of the way that uh, legislatures behave after the passage of charters of rights, uh, uh, justiciable, judicially enforceable charters of rights, whether or not they do renege on their own uh, rights protecting responsibilities. But, but of course, but by the time, how, how will I phrase this? Um, judicial review is normally the worst, like the last ditch scenario. The, you know, the ideal is that uh, you'll have a charter that uh, legislatures and parliament uh, will factor into their decision-making processes at a very, very early stage. And if your argument's right, and um, one of the effects of the charter has been that legislatures have become worse at that, uh, 
uh, worse of of doing their own rights analysis uh, analysis well um i think that's that's an important alternative justification for the clause but but of course to to immediately double back on what i literally just said um the notwithstanding clause is also after the fact um i think the important thing is making sure that rights are factored into the early phases of parliamentary and legislative decision making processes by the time you get to invoking the the notwithstanding clause you've already kind of failed you, you're already at the point of having just this uh blunt quasi dialogue uh, as, as i described it before where the a court has issued its ruling and the legislature stamps down and flatly disregards it i think that's a point that you don't really want to get to uh, so I, I take the point about the the rights protecting role of legislatures but I think that's ideally something that should happen at a much earlier stage in the process. Again, a long answer to a short question. So this might not be a question that you're able to answer, maybe one of those that requires maybe a little bit more research or thought for future, um, but it says, thanks for your insights. At risk of going slightly off topic, I advocate for ratification of charter rights by all provinces. Currently only Quebec has protection for property rights and is quite minimalistic. Under old BNA Act 1867, division of powers, property rights is handed over to the provinces, but ironically only Quebec enacts constitutionally weighted charter of rights, including property rights. I think you're right, Alina. I think that's what I'm gonna to have to pass on. Uh, yeah. That's just it's sort of outside of my expertise as a legal theorist and a comparative law guy. Um, so we're just gonna to hop to the, there's a, someone asking this technical question. And so I'll answer part of this. Um, it says, could we have the slides or an article about the discussion today? Um, so first, with respect to the slides, we'll be posting a recording of this webinar and we'll have the slides with it. And there was an article I know, uh, Richard, that you wrote in 2019, and I'm going to paste the link in response to this question. So all attendees can see it in the answer um, you had written in Constitutional Forum, but I don't know if you had anything upcoming or anything else in the works. But my only advice is don't read my article, read uh, read John White or read Peter Russell or uh, read something better on the notwithstanding clause. Um, so we have another question here. Um, it says a 94 criterion made a little more difficult to men, need Quebec, Ontario, BC, two out of three prairie provinces, two out of four maritime provinces of the federal government to remove section 33. So I think they're commenting uh, for you. R right. Um, so uh, there, there's there's actually a whole bunch of factors that make uh, the amendment formula more difficult to use than it looks like it is. Um, Charlottetown Accord played a big role because one, one of the great things about the Charlottetown process was that there was a conscious effort to correct the mistakes of the Meech process. Uh, so uh, there was a, a you know, really concerted effort to make the process much more inclusive. Uh, and they did that in a couple of ways. One was by including uh, four national indigenous organizations in the negotiations that hadn't happened with Meech. Another was, was by including the then two territorial governments in the negotiating process. Again, that hadn't happened with Meech. And then the third thing, setting aside some of the public consultations that they did, uh, was to have a national referendum to put the question of whether or not to accept the Charlottetown package to people. Now, I think there's an argument with all three of these things, um, Indigenous participation, territorial participation, and the use of a national referendum. Those things are expected now. Um, some would argue that they, they've created uh, constitutional conventions, that there's a constitutional convention, for example, requiring the use of a national referendum. Um, I'm not sure whether that's the case or not, uh, but certainly past practice since 1982 and in particular in 1992, uh, suggests that the political expectations surrounding amendment now make it even harder than it was when the last big amendment was passed in, the only big amendment was passed in 1983. So moving on to a little bit of a different question. So the, I'm gonna read through the whole thing, but ultimately the question I think is essentially is Quebec's current or recent use of, of the notwithstanding clause do you think influences other provinces? So I'll just read the whole question through. So in Quebec, we have recently seen a new use of the notwithstanding clause with Bill 21. And in the new Bill 96, we see the preemptive override of all parts of the charter, as well as the override of the Quebec Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms. 
how do you char characterize this kind of use of Section 33? Uh, so far, this is unique to Quebec. Do you expect it to influence other provinces? Yes, maybe. I don't know. Um, I'm not going to give a very helpful answer here. Um, I, th I think one of one of the risks that you see uh, with the rise of uh, populist governments throughout the world and in Canada is, and I'm not saying this about the government of, of Quebec, um, there, there's populist governments will look to uh, the playbook that's been used in other places to gain any advantage that they need. So once a particular tactic, a particular uh, style of uh, invoking the notwithstanding clause has been used in one place, there is a risk that it will spread across the country to the extent that populism spreads across the country. Um, so this, this is the risk with, um, with the rise of, or rather with the sort of rolling back of the culture of restraint that I talked about before. Um, and, and I think novel ways of using Section 33 uh, can easily be repeated elsewhere. I think that's a very, very unhelpful answer to your question. And it was a, it was a good question, I apologize. Um, more, more, more generally, I think, um, I mean, my, my interest in Bill 96, for example, has been less in uh, the use of Section 33 and more in the fact that it tries to amend the, the uh, Constitution Act uh, 1867. Um, which is another constitutionally very sticky issue. Anyway, I'll, I'll basically pass on that question. I think I've rambled in response to that. Thank you, Richard. So the next question, this goes a little bit back, I think, to why we have the notwithstanding clause in the first place. Uh, was there a rationale or justification given by the framers of the Charter for the notwithstanding clause? Yes, so so that that obviously is is complicated because um, it was a product of sort of last minute brokerage uh, during the the November nineteen eighty one negotiations. Uh, so it depends on who you ask. Um, the the premiers who insisted in the notwithstanding clause, yes, have very comprehensive, um, I think, strategic and principled reasons for wanting the clause in the charter. Uh, the strategic one being what I mentioned during the presentation, which is that they, they don't want to give up an important slice of legislative power. Um, the principled ones being well documented in, there was, um, I think you can probably Google this quickly, but uh, the Premier of, of, of Alberta had written uh, an article, maybe it was for the Centre Alina actually, um, basically outlining why he thought the notwithstanding clause was important and suggesting a few ways that it might be reformed. Uh, so you can find uh, you can find his reasons for wanting the clause in the charter, but obviously his reasons were not Trudeau's reasons, were not the federal government's reasons, were not the reasons of other provinces. Um, looking for looking for an intent, an original intent behind the clause, I think, is maybe less important than uh, trying to view it in its best light today. Uh, so by looking at what it currently does and what it can do um, and seeing the potential in that and imposing a moral purpose on that rather than thinking about what a disparate group wanted uh, whenever the charter was framed. So this question moves a little bit into a different subject. Um, they ask, don't your comments about judicial mistakes put the rule of law into question? Um, isn't it more about a particular legislature not liking what the court has decided or that it wants to shield itself from a breach of the charter by passing a law that is not withstanding the charter? Let me, let me wrestle with that for a second. Don't your comments about judicial mistakes put the rule of law into question? Um, so I don't know. I, I don't think that it's always a case of, um, oh, the question disappeared of uh, not liking what a, a particular court's decided. Um, you can disagree, maybe I'm misunderstanding the question, but you can disagree reasonably on how to interpret the charter. Uh, you can, and you can certainly disagree reasonably on how uh, section one, uh, the Oaks test applies from one case to the next. Uh, 
Um, so there's plenty of room for reasonable disagreement. Um, the, the point, when I was talking about judicial mistakes, um, I was thinking in particular of, of some of, and I think I said this during the presentation, of some of the periods when the US Supreme Court uh, really um, imposed its own problematic way of seeing the world and seeing the relationship between law and society onto the constitution. Um, and did so in a way that potentially, that arguably did a lot of social damage for protracted periods of several decades for, for generations. Um, those I think can fairly be classified as judicial mistakes. Of course, the, because we're dealing with uh, abstract, vague, moral language, like I said at some point during the presentation, um, there's plenty of room for reasonable disagreement. And it's very, very possible that a decision that you look at by a court that you think is grossly unreasonable, someone in another province or in another room or standing right beside you will, will completely disagree with your analysis, will think that it's, it's completely within the sort of sphere of reasonableness that judges have to stay within. Um, does it put the rule of law into question? I'm, I'm not sure. I, I'm, I'm not sure if I, I understood that section of the question, um, but I think there is one, one of the things that does make the notwithstanding clause potentially justifiable is the fact that there is no, no neutral, uh, no self-evident way to interpret uh, the type of abstract provisions that you find in a constitutional bill of rights like the charter. There is room for reasonable disagreement and there should be ways uh, there should be ways to respond whenever a, a court maybe looks like they get it wrong. Can you say conclusively that they've gotten it wrong? Uh, probably not. Uh, there's always the possibility of their decision being overturned uh, down the line. There's always the possibility of constitutional amendment. And I think those are better ways of, of responding to what you see as a judicial mistake. Um, again, as always, long answer to a short question. So we're almost at time and I would just note for any attendees who are interested, there's some interesting commentary and conversations in the questions that you might be interested in looking at um, for our attendees. But I'll just ask maybe one more question or here. Um, and I guess it's kind of an opinion, opinion question, but should section 33 be amended to require exhaustion, i.e. to the Supreme Court? So you have to finish all the appeals. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um... I mean, I mean, I've I've come across that argument before, and I can see uh, the merit of it. Um, so, one of the worst things I think about Section Thirty Three, not that it's often been used this way, but the way that it was just used in in Ontario this year, um, is a classic example of a knee jerk governmental response. And I think, as far as possible, when you're dealing with fundamental rights, and when you're dealing with uh, judicial interpretations and legislative interpretations of fundamental rights. I think you shouldn't have the possibility that a government can immediately come back uh, and basically wipe out, disregard uh, a judicial interpretation that, you know, um, I've read the Ontario Superior, Superior Court's judgment that the Ford government uh, overrode, overrode the section 33, and it's reasonable. Uh, there should be room for a more considered response and maybe letting uh, a case worm its way, work its way through the appeals process uh, is, is a good way of doing that. Wonderful. So, I mean, we are at time. Perhaps there's one question that might just be interesting that maybe won't be too long to answer, sure. but someone's wondering if there's any other countries that have similar clauses. I don't know if, if you have an answer to that. So that's a great question. That's a pet peeve of mine as well. Um, something I see in the press all the time is that the notwithstanding clause is unique and uniquely Canadian. Um, and that's, that's said usually in a pejorative sense. Like, can you believe that we're a complete outlier? No other country in the world has a clause like this. This is crazy. Um, that's true and false. Um, it's true in the sense that I'm, I'm not aware um, of any other country in the world that has a clause that looks exactly like or does exactly what Section 33 does. Um, but, you know, I'm sitting in the UK right now. In the UK, because parliamentary sovereignty is sort of the fundamental principle of our system, 
uh, we don't have uh, judicial review in the sense that Canada has it. Um, judges, courts cannot strike down acts of parliament that violate human rights listed in our Human Rights Act. So our default setting is the use of the notwithstanding clause. In effect, we have a blanket notwithstanding clause because we have this strong system of parliamentary supremacy. The default setting is that courts cannot invalidate acts of parliament and acts of parliament remain valid, notwithstanding any violations of human rights that are listed in our Human Rights Act. Uh, the same is true of New Zealand. Uh, and the same is true, for example, although in a specific way that I won't get into of the Netherlands. So there are lots of other countries around the world um, that have, that actually move much further in the direction of parliamentary supremacy than Canada does with the notwithstanding clause. That doesn't mean that I like the notwithstanding clause, um, but it does mean that the claim that it's unique and uniquely Canadian and that no other country does this uh, isn't isn't really accurate. Thank you so much, Richard. I think that's maybe a lovely way way to wrap up. Um, just a note for our attendees: um, the executive director of the center actually posted the link uh, for um, Premier Peter Lougheed's uh, lecture about the notwithstanding clause. So you can find that if you sort of scroll through the open questions. In case anyone's interested in looking at that. Um, so thank you so much, Richard, um, and uh, your presentation was wonderful, and I think there's been a, a really great conversation. I'm really sorry to our attendees that we weren't able to get through everything, uh, but thank you, Richard, for your knowledge, your experience, and your enthusiasm that you shared with us, um, and for answering the questions uh, from the attendees. I'd also like to thank Zara Ahmed, the Centre's Administrator, and Patricia Parody, the Centre's Executive Director, for their assistance in preparing and advertising the webinar. And of course, thank you so much for everyone who attended today. Um, it's been wonderful to see all your questions and your interest. And um, it, it's just wonderful to see that in our webinar. So thank you so much. Um, we will be having more online charter series coming in the fall. We have another one on October 19th and there should be registration open for that soon. So keep an eye on our social media and your inbox if you receive our emails. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, this webinar has been recorded and it will be available soon on our YouTube and on our website. And just a reminder at the end of this, you're gonna get a little feedback form to fill out. If you can click that link and take, um, just take a couple minutes to fill that feed form, we would greatly appreciate it. So thank you so much, everyone. Mm -hmm.